פרופסור יעקב קובי נחמיאס, קובי זה דירקטור של גראס סנטר של ביו-אנג'ינירינג ודירקטור של ביו-דיזיין ישראל פרוגרם של ההיברי אוניברסיטי של ירוזלם והוא ידבר על הפוטנציאל של PPAR אלפא אגוניסט בטריטמנט של קוביד-19. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, team, for inviting me, and I'll do my best to, uh, to be brief. So we are very excited today because we actually, you, this is going to be the first time that we're going to release clinical data. This is retrospective data, but it's uh, um, highly significant on the use of fibrates, and specifically bezofibrate and later phenofibrate in, um, in a patient population with COVID-19. So... Um, Let's see, here we go. So one of the most interesting things with this virus is its risk, risk factors. As most clinicians know, obese patients are four and a half times more, time, more, more likely to be hospitalized. Patients with dyslipidemia and hyperglycemia are three times more likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19 and suffer severe symptoms. While this very virus that's, that damages the lungs and we know it causes inflammation of the lung, uh, is only one and a half times more likely to affect patients with asthma. So something is very interesting here. The virus seems to have a significant play in metabolic processes. Uh, even though we know it's an inflammatory uh, effect in the lungs, it causes pneumonia and acute respiratory, respiratory uh, distress syndrome. So we have been essentially studying the virus for the last four months, trying to understand What does it do to the host? What does the virus do to the lung cells of the human body? How does it change them to take control of them? Because if we can understand what happens to the host, we can find, maybe we'd be able to find drugs that can actually block that interaction. The biggest problem is that most studies today rely on cancer cell lines. So cells like virus cells or, uh, Or, or others like CACO2 are cancer cells that have a very highly glycolytic response, very different metabolism than the, than the human body. So we have chosen to use tissue dynamics technology to essentially get cells from uh, uh, primary human biopsies. We're using uh, bronchial human epithelial cells to infect the virus in biosafety level three. Uh, with the full strand of the virus and then see what it does to the metabolism and could validate all of our, all of our uh, information in patient biopsies. So the first thing that you can see if you look at the genetic data is that this virus causes a massive metabolic response. About 55 to 65 percent of the genes changed by the virus are, are metabolic. And within this metabolic response, Uh, this, the vast majority of the metabolic response seems to be related to lipid metabolism, essentially the generation of fatty acids. This is happening not only in the Petri dish in our lab, but also in the biopsy samples that we get from patients, both the bronchioli, small lungs, and large lungs epithelial cells. If you look at this genetic signature, you see a couple of things. First of all, the virus causes ER stress. And this, this cellular inflammation is essentially... Uh, causing mitochondrial stress as well. The mitochondria is the main organ organelle by which the, the cell breathes. So the side effect is that the cells can't generate enough energy. So they compensate by, by taking out a lot more glucose into their system, a lot more sugar and burning it. Now this process called glycolysis has a side effect of generating a lot of RNA by the pentose phosphate pathway for the virus replication. We can see it very, very clearly, not only the genetic signature, but in the functional response. And it has another side effect because now lung cells are filled with sugar that they never saw before. They start synthesizing fat and they need fat. The virus actually needs this fat. It needs this fat for palmutilation of their spike protein. It needs this fat for cholesterol to make its replication complexes. And both these pathways are upregulated. Surprising thing is that what the virus actually shuts down. The virus shuts down fatty acid oxidation, essentially suppressing PPR alpha and the only way for the cells to burn fat. 
that can lead to massive lipotoxicity in the lungs. And we think that's exactly what causes inflammation. And indeed, when you look at stained cells, this is exactly what we see. We actually see this massive increase in, in, in intracellular lipids and phospholipids. Now, if we know these pathways, we also know what possible drugs can actually interact here. Everything from glyphosones that can block sugar absorption to metformins that may recover the mitochondria to fibrates that might actually activate fatty acid oxidation to statins that can block cholesterol synthesis. And then we also know what might not work. So TZDs, essentially drugs that, that like rosiglitazone for type two diabetes, activate PPR gamma, actually activate lipid synthesis. So we expect the outcome to be worse for patients taking these drugs. So the most promising here is are, are the drugs that I mentioned. And indeed, if we go, went to buy, when we went to buy safety level three and we did this assay and we looked at the virus production, we see that out of all these drug families, fibrates shut down the virus in five days. We see two log reduction in virion production in the, in the lab. And not only this reduction of virus production, but also all the lipid synthesis that we observed as a hallmark of changed host metabolism disappeared when you expose the cells to phenofibrate in a physiological dose. So we went to retrospective data and essentially asked in the patient population in Israel taking basophibrate, are they more likely or less li likely to, be, to come to the hospital or to come to the ICU? And it turns out that it seems like they are underrepresented in the hospital segments. Suggested that it might not block infection, but certainly block secondary symptoms because of the disease. Essentially turning you know, COVID-19 into you know, a mild cold. And this is super interesting because phenofibrate was approved by the FDA back in 1975. It's a very cheap generic medication and it has an incredible safety profile. So we went and we got a massive amount of retrospective data from both Jerusalem and Tel Aviv medical centers here with Professor Oren Shibolet and Dr. Sigal Shafran Tikva. We looked at 20,000 patients. Out of them, we screened out all patients who didn't have blood measurements, were not hospitalized, or were not over 18 years old. We ended up with 1,500 patients. And when you look at the population that took fibrates and compared it to a PSA matched population that did not take fibrates, you see something very interesting. Even though the risk factors for the fibrates group are slightly higher, all the main indicators are down. Patients that took fibrates were five days less in the hospital, had ICU admission rates dropped from 44% to 7%, and their survival rate increased to about 100%, but this is a small group, we recognize that. But we didn't do only this. We actually looked at the kinetic data with these drugs. And this is CRP level in patients measured every few days. CRP is one of the major indicators of lung inflammation. And you can see that in the fiber case, CRP levels drops like a rock within five days. Now statins and the IRE inhibitor, essentially ER stress inhibitor that we, that we tested, also have an effect, but it's mild. Metformin and SGL2 inhibitors did not have an effect at all. But what's worse, TZDs, essentially drugs like rosiglitazone that were now given for type two diabetic patients actually seem to be worsening the situation exactly as we predicted. But this is only a marker of lung inflammation. Second thing we looked at is hospitalization as a function of, uh, sorry, ICU admission as a function of age. And here again, we see a massive reduction in, in ICU admission for patients that took fibrates. Statins and, and yeah, stress inhibitors also have an effect. The rest of the drugs did not. And this is very, very significant with a p-value under 0.05. The last thing that we want to show is 28 days all-cause mortality. Again, the fiber groups, we didn't have anybody to die, that, that died. The HR is, is, is essentially close to zero. 
Statins, as previous publications showed, seem to have a mild improvement for patients. Uh, but the rest of the drugs did not. Actually, TZDs, again, like rosiglitazone, which is a very similar drug to fiber, it just targets a slightly different receptor. TZDs target PPR gamma, while fiber it's target PPR alpha. One helps break down lipids, the other one helps build lipids. And you can see that TZDs in yellows actually increase mortality in patients, essentially decrease survival probability, while fiber seems to be increasing that. So if this data, our partners, both in the United States and Israel, are starting clinical studies. So the Fermin study that was approved by the FDA last August is headed by Professor Julius, uh, Julius Chirnos at the University of Pennsylvania. And this is a placebo controlled study on phenofibrate looking at 30 days, uh, uh, 30 days uh, vital status, readmissions and major adverse events in phenofibrates with a very comprehensive multicenter study. And with Professor Shlomo Mayan, we're starting uh, a very detailed kinetic study of phenofibrate of that has two phases. The first one is a pilot phase. We hope it's going to start in November. That's going to be a 14-day detailed data collection study where we're taking CRP, neutrophils, a lot of different blood parameters throughout, throughout, the, piece, throughout the period in an open-label study. And the second that ends, we're going to recruit another additional 30 patients for a phase two study that is placebo controlled. So this is where I stop, and I hope I didn't go over the time. And I'll be happy to take questions. I'll just point out that uh, this work was carried out by Avner Ehrlich, Konstantinos Ioannidis, and Merav Kohenimara. And, and Thank you.